Welcome to you too, and I'm very happy you came today, and I'm very happy to be here. It's my first time in Luxembourg. So, uh, about a year ago, I gave a similar lecture in Strasbourg, and that's how uh, I met Emily Muller that invited me here. And I've done uh, this lecture in, it was uh, in, the, in the days of uh, microbiology for uh, master students, uh, PhD and postdocs to show uh, microbiology students that uh, you don't necessarily have to have to do an academic career, but you can also uh, work in public health. So that's why I, I'm just gonna take a minute uh, at the beginning to just tell you about basically the path from academia to public health and how it was for me. And uh, hopefully, so that was my sort of ambition curve uh, through the years. And after I uh, finally got my postdoc, and I thought my career uh, would be in research, uh, I actually got a junior fellowship, and uh, that was really great. I got my university job, and I was really going to do research. Uh, I moved to Sweden. So not only I was from Strasbourg, uh, I had actually been in the doctoral school of uh, uh, Dr. Jules Hoffman. I was thinking that, yes, there it is. I'm close to where I can win the Nobel Prize. After a few years, I thought, well, if I cannot win the Nobel Prize, at least I will leave a footprint in the field. Well, after that, I was like, I, if I don't leave a footprint in the field, at least I will get a, the next grant. For that, I need really to publish. And I came to a point where I was like, OK, am I really going to perish? And that's when I decided to go to public health. And I've actually done that by moving to the European Center for Prevention and Disease Control, uh, the ECDC. And what I have to say is today I'm not uh, representing officially the CDC. I come as an individual uh, expert, so I have a little disclaimer. But I'm still going to tell you a little bit about what ECDC does and what I had contributed uh, to, uh, of the, uh, to the, some project in ECDC, but also what kind of work we do for uh, Europe. So just out of curiosity, because for me, until 2010, ECDC was not even in my radar. How many of you have heard about ECDC? So that's actually quite a big uh, majority. So that's, that's a good start. Uh, just for, this is our new building. We moved uh, there about a year ago. And uh, so you know what ECDC is. It's a European agency. It's a scientific and technical agency. It's located in Stockholm. And uh, it was funded in 2005. Uh, following the SARMS pa pandemic. We are roughly at our cruising speed, so we are uh, about 300 employees for the last couple of years, and our budget is roughly uh, 59 million euro, which is not excessively much, but, and that com comprise infrastructure salaries and uh, actually our uh, work. We work for the European Union, which means uh, 28 countries still, and uh, the European Economic Area, which are three countries more. So in total, we are working for 31 countries, and that represents 500 million people. And not only it represents 500 million people, but it represents 31 different health structures and different public health structures. So we have uh, 31 countries with different cultures and different way of uh, taking care of um, the patient. We have a mission to uh, identify, assess, communicate uh, current and emerging threats to human health from communicable disease. So we are uh, having a very much narrow mandate to infectious disease and not uh, broader, like, for instance, the WHO. And very important to remember is we do not have any risk management mandate. That stays with the member state. So we are risk assessor. So basically, we are assessing the risk and we're reporting to member states that will make a decision to act upon it or not. But I came here today to tell you a little bit more about antimicrobial resistance. And I will start with uh, a famous quote from Dame uh, Sally Davis, which really put the focus on antimicrobial resistance very much uh, at the European level and the global level. And it is a bit of a, a, a scary opening because she... She said, you know, the world is facing an antibiotic apocalypse. And apocalypse doesn't really sound right. But I will show you that, in a way, it was good to actually have this public advocacy to put antimicrobial resistance on the front of the agenda at the global level. 
but I will also show you that we are capable of doing things together. And uh, yes, the situation is apocalyptic, but we, it's like climate change. You need to be aware of it to be able to act upon it. So just, uh, just to, and that is probably very obvious for you, I mean, antimicrobial resistance is a natural uh, mechanism. Uh, we find it in uh, everywhere, and it's very much related to antibiotic consumption. You can find it in the environment, uh, in animal and food, but you find it also in community and in hospital. What you can see from this slide is that the consumption of antibiotics is mostly uh, done in the community, on the human side, and, um, but it is in hospitals that we have the major problem with uh, multi-drug resistance and uh, extensive drug resistance and pen drug resistance. All these three uh, sectors are not closed, so we have interactions. And antimicrobial resistance is also very much influenced by the fact that we actually do import food, we import animals. Uh, this is very relevant actually for the European Union where we have free trade and free travel. Uh, in the community we all travel very much uh, everywhere and uh, this is also very important for the European Union. You know that you can get healthcare in any of the countries of the European Union, and this is happening more and more often. So we have cross-border transfer of, of patients. And that all that situation influences very much uh, the resistance. So when we talk about resistance for a long time, uh, People were saying, it's like, yeah, but what is the burden of it? You know, how much does it cost in terms of life? How much does it cost in terms of money? And uh, we have to say that in that front, the UK was very much a front runner. They have been very much interested in cost effectiveness and, and calculating the burden. So in 2016, uh, there's the O'Neill report that came out, and they had estimated that approximately each year, 700,000 people died from antimicrobial resistant infection in the world. And that is now. And they made an estimation in the future that if we don't curb the antimicrobial resistance in the future, by 2015, approximately 10 million people would die each year. So uh, that was globally. Uh, we wanted to see at ECDC what are the numbers for, for Europe, and those are the new numbers that just got published recently. We had uh, previous numbers, and uh, we looked at the burden uh, of uh, antimicrobial resistance in the EU EEA, and this is approximately 33,000 uh, deaths each year that can be attributable to multidrug resistant bacteria. 75% of this burden is actually due to bacteria that are resistant to antibiotics to in uh, healthcare associated infection. So it's mostly uh, hospital acquired. So how do we do surveillance in, in Europe? So we have a system that is called the European uh, Antimicrobial Resistance Surveillance Network or EOSNET. That network uh, was not created by CDC. It was uh, actually created in 1998 uh, by a group of um, public health uh, um, agencies and uh, researchers that put together. It was called EARS and it was located at the RIVM. And the, the aim of EARS and then later on EARSnet when it was transferred to ECDC in 2010 was to uh, get comparable uh, AMR data to allow trend analysis and benchmarking. Uh, the way they were uh, actually setting up uh, that system to make it easy, because it is a lot of countries with different ways uh, of organization, was to try to take routine data. So basically, it's based on a voluntary uh, participation of local uh, microbiology laboratory and based on routine data. It's an annual collection, so it is not an extra burden for uh, the laboratory. Uh, it's a fixed surveillance panel, so there's eight uh, bacterium that are uh, under surveillance, and it concerns only invasive isolates. So it's a, a quite narrow uh, focus. But what EARSnet is not, and that is really relevant for the second part of my talk, is that it is not an early, early warning system. Because it's an annual collection, the data we get and we report are always one year old. So it cannot actually, you cannot have very quick action, uh, infection prevention action based on EARSnet data. 
and it is uh, not a source of detailed information. So we do not uh, report the mechanism of resistance. There are no uh, patient risk factors associated with uh, those data. There's no outcome information. And uh, I added, there's no geolocalization of patients and place of infection. It is aggregated data at the national level. All right, so which, which kind of data do we get from EOSNET? So we get a trend, uh, we get a percentage of resistance, and we can visualize it in different ways. It can be in tables and so on and so on. One very effective way of showing um, the percentage of resistance, especially across Europe, is to make maps. And here I took an example of Klebsiella pneumoniae because Klebsiella pneumoniae is uh, uh, known to be one of the major factors for community and hospital acquired infection. And it is also uh, uh, one of the bacterium that uh, gets very resistant. It's on the WHO list for the critical bacteria where we really are in need of uh, new antibiotics. And I just made a time series of maps starting from 2006 to 2017, which are our latest data. And I choose to take combined resistance to uh, fluoroquinolone, uh, third generation cephalosporin, and aminoglycoside. And just because those are the routine antibiotics you use in the clinic to treat patients. And what you can see, and this is one of the first challenge, is that we are not equal in Europe. I mean, already very early on, you can see that some countries had already a very, so the, the redder, the worse. So the redder, the higher the resistance percentage is. And you can see that already in 2006, countries were not equal with a very much south-north gradient, with countries in the south having very high levels of resistance already uh, compared to the north of uh, Europe. And then you see that across the, the, the years, the map gets redder and redder and redder. And we come in 2017 where uh, we have an increased uh, level of resistance, uh, combined resistance to uh, fluoroquinolone, third generation cephalosporin and aminoglycoside. So what do you do when you have a patient that has a multidrug resistance infection? You actually go for um, the last line antibiotics. And that uh, is the carbapenem. And the carbapenem are considered as the antibiotics of the last resort. But who says uh, antibiotics says uh, resistance? So of course there are resistance to carbapenem, and there's two ways to be uh, to acquire this uh, resistance. Either you have a decreased permeability from the bacterium through porin, so other mechanism, or you actually um, produce a carbapenemase that hydrolyzes uh, the antibiotic. Uh, when we look at the mechanism behind the resistance to carbapenemase, to carbapenem, through carbapenemase production, there are approximately five most frequent carbapenemase, which are uh, so the Klebsiella pneumoniae carbapenemase (KPC), Verona integrin encoded metallobetalactamase (VIM), IMP type beta 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 metallobetalactamase uh, (IMP). The new Delhi metallobetalactamase metallo NDM like and the carbapenem hydrolyzing oxycylinase uh, oxa for, uh, oxa like. So basically, uh, at ECDC, we were uh, looking at carbapenem resistance uh, starting also in 2006 and uh, using the EarthNet surveillance system. Um, and what we can see is that in 2006, it looked that it was not that much of a problem. The resistance was rather low, with the exception of Greece. And that was already known because Greece had already a nationwide um, spread of uh, carbapenem uh, producing antibacteriaceae due to KPC. And that was known, and, uh, but looking through the years, it didn't look much was happening. You know, you have a sense that, okay, it is still below. 1% uh, in most of the countries in Europe. But then in 2009 came a paper uh, by a British group uh, in association with a Swedish group. And they had discovered a new uh, mechanism of resistance for carbapenem. And it's the uh, NDM, or New Delhi uh, metallobetalactamase gene. And it could have been simply a new mechanism. Nothing more about it. but. 
in very few months, there are warning signs that came. So in the hospital in the UK, suddenly cases with this uh, type of uh, resistant bacteria were appearing. So in 2007, they had not identified a single one of, of this infection. And suddenly in 2010, they had 18 cases. And then it made it very much in the news, quite serious um, news, but very quickly we could see that it was not only uh, restricted to the UK, but it was also other countries that started to report the appearance of these super bugs. So basically, then as ECDC, we had to do something because we had an increasing number of reports from member states asking us, okay, now we have a new mechanism of resistance, what, what do we do? What do we know? And at the CDC, uh, our surveillance system could not actually discriminate between the different type of resistance. So what we did is making risk assessment. And that way, what we uh, actually did uh, is to make um, a survey. So we contacted every single country in Europe and asked them, have you seen or not this new uh, resistance mechanism? And we produced the first uh, risk assessment on NDM um, infection in, in Europe. Simultaneously, an independent group of experts uh, in Europe decided to get together and uh, look and make a risk assessment as well. And that is the paper that I uh, put here. And what they did is, because obviously EarthNet could not actually show the real situation, they decided as a group of experts to uh, develop a scale, an epidemiological scale, because the percentage could be very low, but it didn't actually reflect the natural spread. So they came with this scale, which is, okay, we decide that we have either no case that are reported, or we have sporadic occurrence of cases, or we have single hospital outbreaks, or at the country level, we have sporadic hospital outbreaks, or we can see that we have different hospital in, in the region that have outbreaks, or we have outbreaks in different region of the country, or we have an endemic situation. So most of the hospital in the country do see this kind of infection. And that scale, they use them to actually ask every single country and say, please, can you tell us what do you see in your country? And you can see that the map is not as green as the EarthNet map. And here we could see that already we had some countries that had endemic situation, like in the EarthNet, but we also saw that Italy and, uh, and Poland were actually reporting that we might still have very low level of resistance, but we see that we have outbreaks uh, in different hospitals. So the nationally, it's more spread than we actually can report through EarthNet. So that is 2010, and that was very useful because we, we really needed to know what was going on. We still didn't know about the laboratory capacity uh, of the member state to actually detect uh, this kind of infection. But we continue to, at ECDC to actually look at, uh, at NDM1 and, and the, the variants, still asking through surveys. But also we realized very quickly that because patients on transfer between hospitals and between countries, that we, need, we needed to make an assessment on is there a risk for patients that are actually going to get treatment in countries where you have an endemic situation and so on. So we, we came with uh, another risk assessment on patient transfer and uh, some option for action. And we continue to monitor. And indeed, what we could see that soon after the first report of NDM, we suddenly realized that the carbapenem resistance was really actually increasing and we started to see it in EarthNet. But like I said to you, EarthNet is not an early warning system. So we see things much later on. And we can see that in 2010, indeed, Italy had already a problem. And we can see that this was actually continuing through time. But because EarthNet could not give us any data on the resistance mechanism and the geographic distribution, 
or risk factors, or the place of infection, the level of spread, but uh, could not tell us about the laboratory capacity and the capacity of response of the member state. In 2012, we actually decided at ECDC that we needed to uh, start a, new, a project. And we call it the European Survey on Carbapenemase Producing Antibacteriaceae. It's the USCAPE project. And I will go through that and we'll show you a little bit um, what, we, what was the objective, how we designed the study to be complementary to the normal surveillance system, what we discovered about the epidemiology of uh, those bacteria in Europe, and, and some of the results. So what we wanted to know in 2000, then it was in 2012, was we needed to, to gain insight in the occurrence and the epidemiology of the carbapenemase producing antibacteria, say CPE. And also the associated factor, where do you get this infection from and, and uh, what are the risks for getting this type of infection. But also we wanted to increase the awareness about the spread of CPE because EarsNet gave this fake sense of non-urgency while we knew from sporadic reports and publication that this was not actually the case. And we also needed to build the laboratory capacity uh, for diagnosis and surveillance. And that again, it's because Europe is very diverse. We have 31 countries with high uh, resource country and low resource countries, with countries with a very well-defined healthcare and uh, associated laboratories, and some countries where it is a little bit less um, organized. Uh, so the way we designed it, so it was a pan-European structure survey, so we managed to include all 31 uh, EU EEA countries, and we got lucky to be also able to uh, include all the EU enlargement countries. So those are the candidate and potential candidate country to enter the European Union, like Albania, Kosovo, Macedonia, uh, Turkey, uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, we also decided that uh, we, since it's, a, it's an additional project, it, it's an additional burden, we, I'm going to try to make a, a more active uh, surveillance, but based on routine laboratory work with some additional uh, molecular characterization and uh, collection of uh, data. So we wanted to have more patient data and uh, especially on uh, risk factors. It would be a punctual uh, data collection and sample frame. So we decided it would be a six month period where uh, every country would collect uh, the specimens, it would be all clinical specimen. We removed the screening uh, fecal samples and we actually managed to have all the countries involved in the, in, the, in the project to use an agreed protocol. And we supported uh, the, the protocol with a training workshop and a new QA to make sure that everyone that participated had the same knowledge, the same protocol and the same capacity to um, collect the information we wanted. And um, we organized it that way, that we actually selected a national coordinator in each country that was uh, uh, responsible to recruit hospitals. We had defined how many hospitals per country we wanted with smaller country having lower number of hospitals to recruit and bigger country uh, more uh, hospital. The hospital were collecting the sample and the clinical and epidemiological data. They were sending uh, the samples to the regional laboratory to do the uh, antimicrobial susceptibility testing. And then they were sending the samples uh, to characterization to the National Reference Lab or Expert Lab of, the, of this country to confirm the antimicrobial susceptibility testing, but also looking at uh, the mechanism of resistance at the time by PCR. And then everything was sent to a central data management to, to aggregate and collect uh, all the data from uh, all the 37 countries. We also actually uh, had a memorandum of understanding with Israel to participate to that country. At the end, what uh, we collected, we collected um, 10, so each hospital that was recruited was uh, collecting 10 uh, carbapen MAs, non-susceptible, uh, either Klebsiella pneumoniae or E. coli, and then 10 consecutive uh, susceptible ones. So we had the background population and we had the resistant population to compare. 
At the end, we actually had 555 hospitals participating uh, in that project. And th those are all the red dots you can see on the map. And we collected approximately 2,700 isolates. And as you can see, we collected more Klebsiella pneumoniae than E. coli. And out of that, we had uh, 1,200 that were considered as carbapenemies, non-susceptible. And of those, we had only 850 that were actually carbapenemase producer. What I would like to highlight is that project is the first project of this kind and one of the biggest where it is at the continent level involving so many countries. And uh, this is a great opportunity we had and, uh, and that I would like to highlight by the fact that we are working uh, in the European Union how this is possible. It is also a challenge because we are working with uh, different countries, with different cultures and different uh, systems. What I want to come back to, so the, those are some of the results. So do you remember that's the, the map that was mapping using this uh, epidemiological scale, uh, the situation in 2010, the USCAP project started in 2012, 2013. So we did the same uh, survey and what we could see already between 2010, not only we could actually include the Balkan countries, there was a change in color. So the countries that were green started to turn more in the orange, meaning that actually there, are, there was national spread. And that is at the end of the project. So by the end of the project, when we build the capacity, when everyone actually been looking in a very structured, harmonized way, we could see that basically the situation was more alarming than we actually had thought about. What we also found out is, is actually looking into which kind of mechanism was behind the resistance. We could see also that, and here I'm just highlighting the three most common carbapenemase and the most common uh, resistant mechanism behind the carbapenemase resistance, KPC, NDM, and OXA48, like, we can see that again, we are not equal. Not all the countries are affected by the same kind of uh, resistance. And if we look, we knew already from the early 2000s that uh, Greece had a national spread of KPC uh, CPE. And indeed, we could see here that they are actually more affected by KPC. They were very little affected by OXA 48 like. On the contrary, if you look at Spain, France, and Belgium, they were more affected by OXA 48. So we, different countries have different problems. And that might mean that we need to actually target our intervention in a different way, depending on which kind of threat we are facing. And that was the first time we actually had such a comprehensive view of what was affecting the different countries. And if we look at the NDM1, which was the basically the, the factor that actually really started up all this study because of uh, this new mechanism that was, uh, was seen, we could see that indeed the UK was uh, affected, but other countries were also very much affected already, although they had not reported it. We also then look at risk factors and we could actually uh, confirm for the first time that indeed it is mostly, uh, this resistance is mostly uh, associated with uh, being in the hospital, uh, mostly uh, related to the fact that uh, you have a higher risk if you are in intensive care unit, which is also the place where you are more likely to be uh, getting an antibiotic. That again, uh, we could see that previous hospital hus uh, admission was actually a risk factor. And, and here we are thinking also, uh, especially with an aging population, uh, a population being in long-term uh, care facility that are going from the long-term uh, long care facility to the hospital back and forth, having several course of antibiotic treatment.
but it, also what we could see is that we had an uh, increased risk factor with previous travel abroad. So basically, if we look at uh, the Uscape project, what is very interesting is that, first of all, we were able to show that we can make a structured survey at the European level, and that we actually managed to coordinate 38 countries to do the same kind of work at the same time and collect the same kind of information. We raised the awareness very much, showing that, you know, although you might have a, within the, your surveillance system very low resistance level, you might still have a national spread of this kind of infection. And we've really much improved um, laboratory and response capacity. So if we look, then the project finished in 2015, and going back to the EARSNA data, we can see that the situation is not actually improving. Uh, and now in 2017, we can see that there are more and more countries that are uh, turning red and orange. This is not uh, a problem only for uh, Europe. It is a global problem. And this is the latest data that is available on um, uh, the site of WHO. And we can see that there is a problem uh, not only uh, in Europe, but uh, in many parts of the world. And we have many parts of the world where we do not have any data at all. So. There's definitely um, more work to do. What on the implication for human health when we get this uh, last line um, antibiotic, resistance to this last line antibiotic? Well, when the carbapenems are not working anymore, the only antibiotic we have left are colistin and others, and uh, quite of these antibiotics uh, have not been used for, or have been used, but were left because of their toxicity. And here I got, uh, just to show you an antibiogram, uh, it is from a Swedish hospital, where we can see a multidrug resistant, which is only susceptible to colistin. So basically, we now need to look at resistance to colistin. And it, those are the data from EARSnet on carbapenem resistance. And that is really the tip of the iceberg. So if you have multidrug resistant, you have to use colistin. What will happen? You will get resistance to colistin as well. And we already see that the countries that very, have very high re, uh, level of resistance of carbapenem also have higher level of resistance of colistin. So we are actually emptying our um, pharmacy cabinet. And, um, and that's why we need to do something about it. Uh, the project Uscape stopped in 2015, and there has been quite a lot of development. One part we didn't do in 2015 was to include whole genome sequencing uh, on this isolate collection. At the time, uh, member states were not ready ECDC did not have the capacity to support whole genome sequencing for all these strains. But the coordinator of that project, uh, the University of Groningen, associated with the Sanger uh, Institute in the UK, decided that they will do it. It took a long time, but I know that the paper will come out very, very soon. So all the Uscape isolate, or 1,700 of this isolate, have now been um, uh, whole genome sequenced. And the, the publication is about to come out. And that um, study shows and really looks at cross-border uh, possibility of a transmission of clones, how many clones uh, are actually spreading in Europe, and can we actually have some discriminatory um, uh, SNPs level for transmission between hospital within a hospital and between countries. So this is about to come. So basically, since uh, the Uscape, there's a lot of things that have happened. Not only the resistance to colistin has increased, but we also discovered that uh, colistin resistance is not only due to point mutation, but it's also actually possible that it is associated with a plasmid. So there is more pressure now uh, for us at the European level to actually look into colistin resistance. 
On the positive side is also what we can see is that the capacity of Europe and the member states have increased for whole genome sequencing. So here I just put uh, the result on, we have been looking the, at the capacity of the EU member states uh, since 2013 for whole genome sequencing. And you can see that in 2013, none of the countries in Europe were using whole genome sequencing for surveillance or outbreak investigation. And then we start to have a very steep increase with now 20 countries out of 20 or 31 that are actually using it at least for one pathogen. So that's why we decided that we need to repeat the USK project but including not only cholestine resistance, but also look at uh, whole genome sequence. So that project just started, so it's at the beginning. And I'm just gonna go through uh, the objective, the study design, and uh, again, to show you what are the latest epidemiology uh, of CP in Europe. So we have a different objective, is again to look at the occurrence, the geographic distribution, the population dynamic, because now we would like to actually know what is responsible behind this uh, carbapenem resistance. Uh, are they high risk uh, carbapenem resistant or cholestine resistant clones? And are they associated with transmissible um, genetic elements uh, in Europe? The secondary objective is to confirm uh, the risk factor we had identified in, uh, in the USCAPE project or identify additional one. And also, we very much would like to support uh, EU member states in the capacity for um, genom genomic-based surveillance. And again, we have very different um, capacity in Europe. And I just learned this morning that I know that in the, in the Luxembourg, basically you really switching entirely to whole genome sequence sequencing, but this is not the case for uh, a lot of the countries in, in, uh, in Europe. What we decided to do also is that we actually looked back at the hospital that participated to USCAPE, and what we could see is that although we had 555 hospitals in USCAPE, we did not have a, a full complete uh, geographical distribution of the hospital. We did not cover uh, very well uh, Europe in a very harmonized way. So you can see that for some countries it's very easy. For Iceland there's only one hospital. So for Luxembourg it's also much easier. But then we have countries like France, where I come from, where we had a lot of hospitals, a lot of, um, uh, of samples, but a large area where we had uh, actually no data at all. So we have decided now that we will change uh, the recruitment of the hospital and we are gonna base it that we want at least one hospital by all these uh, different uh, regions. Uh, we have to know that also population-wise, we are not homogeneous. So uh, some of the region are very heavily populated and some are very little populated. So we decided also that, especially for a, a country like Germany, uh, they will have to recruit more hospital if they have a population uh, of more than two and a half million. So we again gonna collect uh, isolates of carbapenem resistant E. coli and Klebsiella pneumoniae. And we now optionally ask also uh, countries to uh, put cholestine resistance uh, isolates. And we ask them again to give us the comparator uh, susceptible to be able to actually analyze uh, the resistant population within the susceptible population. So again, I go back again to the epidemiological situation in 2010. At the beginning of the USK project 2013, at the end of uh, the project 2015. And these are the latest results. They were published last week in Eurosurveillance where we can see that at the start of the new project, it is not improving. Now I also have to uh, make a little disclaimer, is that with the increased capacity, we also have countries that are capable to detect more. So we have a worsening of the situation, but we also have increased the awareness. So countries that were not capable to actually identify 
this kind of uh, infection are capable of doing it. So there's more reporting. So we have improved the uh, reporting, we have improved the um, detection. But this is where we are now. What do we expect from uh, this new project? Well, we would like to have more precise information at the epi epidemiological level, but also at the molecular level. Because what we are thinking is that since we are not equal with the type of infection we get, we need to have better target controlled measures. And we have to also consider that for we need to actually allocate the right resources for the right kind of uh, uh, intervention. We also would like to know more about the cross-border uh, spread and also improve the collaboration cross-border. And I know, for instance, that this is already actively done between the Netherlands and Germany and Belgium, where the hospitals that are very close by the border are actually already sharing data. And this is with this project what we are also trying to uh, foster. And we really would like to increase the capacity of the entire Europe to actually shift to uh, genome sequencing. So what we are hoping in the future is that the Eurogene Euro net is a one step to address all these needs. What I'm gonna show you now is a, a case that happened um, a few months ago, which is an example of what we would like to achieve in, in the long run with, uh, with uh, Eurogene. And so this is, uh, it is a case study that happened. It's a real case. It's Sweden that actually approached the CDC and said, we would like to use your platform of close communication. So we have a platform called EPIS, where the country can log in and communicate to each other uh, information about new resistance mechanisms, about infections. And in this case, it was Sweden that said, well, we have patients uh, that are coming tourists that have been in Gran Canaria, uh, they have all the same um, uh, infection and they are all been treated at the same hospital in the Gran Canaria. We would like to actually communicate in a very private way with Spain so they can actually investigate this hospital, but also ask other countries if they have found the same kind of um, uh, pattern. And it turned out that actually by doing that, uh, Norway and Finland responded saying, well, we actually have also patients that uh, have been uh, coming back with the same type of infection uh, from the same uh, region and from the same hospital. And then they went into uh, sharing together and uh, making the whole genome sequencing. And what they could actually see is that all these patients actually clustered together. And then the, indeed, there was an outbreak in that hospital that had not actually been discovered. And this is a little bit how we are thinking in the future. And then it was really nice because by communicating with other countries, we could put resources together, find uh, an outbreak, could actually communicate with the country where the outbreak was happening, and this country to be able to actually contact the hospital and take the appropriate measure for uh, controlling the outbreak. Uh, we actually, the way we actually reporting that is by doing risk assessment. So we actually publish. So if you want the full story about that uh, outbreak uh, in the Grand Canaria, you can actually read it. So this is a little bit where we would like to go with Eurogene being able that at the European level, we can all collaborate and share data. We are very far from achieving that, but it is the first step. Now, I, I'm actually going to switch a little bit uh, because, as you, you can see, we are more on the communication level. So ECDC has not a risk management mandate, but a risk assessment mandate. And usually who we are talking to are health professional, but also policymaker. And quite often when we interact with health professionals, they say, well, we cannot change if the policymaker do not uh, implement uh, or change laws and so on. And what I want to say, and that is actually also very true in, in, in science, in research, is that science isn't finished until it's communicated. And that is the, you have to publish your data. But it's not only publication. Uh, that are important. And at ECDC, we do a lot of publication, we do a lot of reports, we do a lot of uh, peer review uh, articles. But these are not actually reaching our policymakers. So, and they are not reaching 
the awareness of the, of the public or the awareness of the policymakers. So one way we are trying to do is to actually first reach the media. By reaching the media, we create awareness as well. And that way, we're also creating awareness at a political level. So the, the USCAPE results have been very much communicated on very spe specific uh, occasion, and we actually reached out to the media. So those are just a few examples on the on media that had picked up on the, on the result. Uh, we also reached out to, which is our main stakeholder, which is the European Commission, and um, we were uh, very lucky that the Commission actually communicated uh, as well our results, and that also increased the political uh, level of uh, all the work. Uh, we had uh, actually the Commissioner for Health and Food Safety that uh, also put forward uh, our work to, uh, again, raise the political awareness around the, the issue. Uh, to help, uh, basically, policymakers, we also made policy brief because we know that policymakers have many, many political issues. They have very little time and they will not read our full report. So we made uh, different types of communication with some key messages. Yes. Uh, we actually try to reach the parliament as well, uh, very important. We make social media outreach by infographics to explain more on social media. To have a... We actually got very lucky with the Uscape. We actually been reached by the industry to uh, reproduce our maps. So here they are, the maps that they were using. Uh, so although we are not working with industry as a public health agency, we still have... Uh, uh, the industry is interested in our data. What I want to say is that all that has created a lot of political engagement. And yes, we are not in a very good position, but we are in a better position because we have a global awareness. So in 2015, there's the Global Action Plan to tackle AMR that was uh, voted at the World Health Assembly. We can see that since then, that the latest data is most of the countries in, in, in the world are actually developing national action plans. We see in Europe, we are actually in a better position than in most parts of the world, because most of the countries have uh, an action plan or on the way of having an action plan. At the European level, we have the second uh, action plan, which is a One Health action plan, uh, which is very important. And what I want to just finish with is that all that work also created awareness for countries to implement uh, infection control uh, guidelines. And we can see that in, in 2013, we had um, only 24 countries, uh, 22 countries that had uh, infection control measures. Some were preparing and quite a lot of countries did not have anything in place. And we see that with time it's increasing because it is also important to have guidelines to be able to actually uh, have interventions. So yes, we are in the uh, antibiotic apocalypse, uh, apocalypse, but at the same time, the awareness is there and there is commitment to actually try to do something about it. So I just would like to finish by saying, uh, remember, keeping antibiotic effective is uh, everyone's responsibility, is yours, is mine, is the policymakers, is, um, is the industry, is, uh, is everyone. And if you want to get involved, there's the 18th of November. It's the European Antibiotic Awareness Day. There are many activities around Europe and globally. Uh, very active at all different levels. And I just would like to finish very quickly by saying that all that work is not my work. Uh, it's, first of all, uh, without the member state, without the data provider, so meaning, you know, people in laboratories, in hospital, collecting data, people in national reference lab, confirming the data, aggregating the data, sending the data to ECDC, we would not be able to present you that work. We could not be um, coordinating th that work. Uh, for the USCAPE, uh, 38 countries, uh, that is a great achievement. And uh, without them, we would have not been able to. Your gene is 37 countries. We have also national focal points in, in each country that uh, are involved. The national focal point for microbiology have been involved also to provide us all this data. And uh, I would like also to say that, uh, well, there's many of my colleagues at ECDC in different teams that are collecting all this data. And um, the Eurogene uh, 
uh, network is coordinated by Anki Kollenberg. And I know that uh, Luxembourg is actually uh, participating with Marie sitting there. And that was my last uh, slide. for this uh, very nice presentation. Are there questions in the audience? So just to answer, the, the Swedish case is a, is, a, is a good example, but we have to remember for, in Sweden, uh, they have, uh, when you enter a hospital, you have your admission form, on your admission form, they have questions asking you already, have you been abroad the last six months? Have you been hospitalized abroad? If you have, where? This is not the case in all the countries in Europe. So not everyone is actually capable to trace back because th those are the questions that are not necessarily asked at uh, admission. And uh, it is very much the case in Scandinavia. So I know that Finland does it, uh, Norway does it, Sweden does it. I know Netherlands has put it in place now. So not everyone is actually capable to pinpoint uh, where the location, so that is, one already difference. Then again, uh, Sweden was doing already whole genome sequencing. So they had already found this uh, cluster of five related to the same hospital, but also uh, related genomically together. So it is sort of a, the, the perfect case study. Then uh, regarding One Health, we do work on the One Health. For this kind of study, it is not. It is very much focused on hospital and the hospital um, uh, resistance and the hospital transmission. So we have not included uh, the One Health and the, the, the animal. But I know that uh, at ECDC we do work with EFSA to actually link uh, resistance both from the, uh, vector, the veterinarian and the food sector and the human. I just want to add to the Swedish mm -hmm. outbreak in Canada. And we in Luxembourg at the LNS, we also had where well, we do whole genome sequencing, so we also had an isolate which was uh, sequenced in, in the virology department, which looked like it could have been part of the, uh, the, the uh, Scandinavian outbreak. So we, so we transferred the data to, to Sweden. Once we detected that this sequence factor 392, the cell of pneumonia, but it turned out that it wasn't actually connected with the sequence. So we wanted to be part of the outbreak, but we couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, congratulations, really mm -hmm. powerful data, and uh, um, I think um, you know, really important uh, talk, which kind of um, um, you know kind of slowly introduces you to a bit of a public health crisis, which uh, which is uh, looming. So mm -hmm. it's um, you know I think it's probably the nature of that for the, the resistance that it takes um, a couple of years to build up. 
sort of um, um, the, the, the desperation in a way becomes almost normality. Because it's not like that, you know, normally catastrophes have uh, shock events where something really awful happens overnight and, uh, and there's a lot of uh, attention um, pressing into your almost normality uh, where you end up in a uh, situation um, you know, where you have a patient uh, like the one that on the dream show where um, you know, uh, you literally have um, a part of time that is at risk and capture um, and um, when you think of um, Say the, uh, the achievement of uh, modern medicine and uh, a lot of um, you know the trivial but very invasive uh, procedures that we do uh, nowadays. Um, um, you know, without uh, without antibiotics, you can pretty much forget all of that in the in the future. So um, I think the one question I had, and I probably missed that um, in in uh, in your PCLA uh, data. Were these uh, colonizations? Were they infections? Were they? I'm sure they weren't all mushroom infections. No, it's um, it's it's a mix. Is that uh, um, multiple colonization? So we 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 took both colonization and infection, uh, and but we could not see an associated risk factor with one or the other. So, but it is a mix. It is a mix of colonization and uh, and infection. So the only the only sample we didn't take is fecal screening, which now will be uh, accepted in the Eurogene uh, Net project. And the reason for that is that many of the countries from the Nordic countries uh, do not have many uh, infection. So they do not have carbapenem resistance as infection, but a lot as colonization and screening, uh, I mean, fecal colonization. And uh, for them to be able to be part of it, we allow them now to do actually send the screening. And I also thought it was good that um, you showed the, the sort of, um, you could say, uh, corrective associated mortality mm -hmm. data, which is that you know they only look as a yeah. factor of yeah. criticism. Mm -hmm. um, uh, by then, it was a little bit of a political report, and I think originally uh, commissioned to KPMG. I think that's really good that uh, an organization such as this follows up with uh, data which, uh, which are then contacted. It's very, very important from a political point of view in order to um, convince uh, policymakers that um, you know, we need to do something and we can do so, right? Infection yeah. prevention control, antibiotics to make sure it keeps the system up to date. So, so the, the, like you said, the O'Neill report had a, a lot of criticism, and this is also why ECDC actually updated uh, the burden for the EU to actually really put it back to perspective for the EU with all the uh, limitations that the European data have as well. So both the O'Neill report and our uh, data, are it is still modeling, it's still estimation, so there's still some limitation to it, but it is uh, getting a closer... Um, estimate of the burden and, and for policymakers this is more important is to have the burden than having maps with colors that uh, you know saying this is a this is dangerous and it's important they, they want death and money thank you for the great talk I just have one question it's a little bit related to the first one about um, the animals and the animal treatment because in yeah. to my logic quite a lot yeah. of use in animals mm -hmm. and you mentioned that they also go together with the APSA but mm -hmm. is there the same kind of um, maps established also for colistin resistance and do they have the same patterns as like in humans? I, I know that they are looking at colistin, but I'm not sure they are looking as closely. I might actually turn to you. Do you know that for uh, the food and water bond? Because I'm, I'm really... I'm more on the human side, so I have not really... But I don't think they're looking as closely to cholestine uh, resistance. They do. <laughs> they do, okay. No, no, it is, it is looked at uh, yeah. also for, for, uh, or for e Ectola and Salmonella. So it's, it's being introduced more and more. There are like monitoring programs in place where, for, uh, where human and, and particularly in the, 
in the food sector is done. So that's it's been in over the past two or three years. There's been a lot of changes there, and and so you know, this is one of the major thoughts I'm making. Any other questions? Any other questions? Sorry. Uh, I, I actually might just have one, one quick one. Um, so it, it looks bad uh, when you mm -hmm. dark uh, on this map mm -hmm. um, as a country, uh, Greek, uh, mm -hmm. Greece and Italy. Um, are you aware that there have been any measures in the countries to try and, and do something about it? Or uh, are you aware that this data is being actually being fed up to the to the policymakers or even hostile infection control teams where they try and, and see uh, how, how they can, how, how the, you know, Okay, we see it's bad, but is something done about it, or is this just kind of uh, just disappearing in a I can, in, in, in also? On, on so I, I can say for for Italy, um, when we started in two thousand thirteen, they had not any uh, guidance on infection control and prevention, and uh, when we uh, had the, the map coming. It has been a. It made a lot of attention, and then actually at the government level, they decided, okay, now we need to do something about it. So there has been a, a, a raise of awareness at the political level, and again, as you know, in many countries, as long as the politician and the policymaker are not implementing a law or making it mandatory, things are not happening down the line. So it has changed in Italy. Also, they have been really looking at the USCAPE study and they really realized that they really had a national spread in many of their hospitals and that actually 42% of their USCAPE Klebsiella and pneumonia strains were also colistin resistant. So they could not turn a blind eye anymore. So there are interventions that are uh, taking place. Greece had had a rough time for economical reasons, so there has been, it is more punctual than a national wide uh, intervention. But there are, there are interventions that are taking place, maybe more isolated at hospital level than at um, regional level. And, and again, as, a, as ECDC, we have no risk management power. We have only the risk assessment. So we, we can just advise and give options. We cannot ask countries to implement anything. Oh, there's one more question. Maybe final one then before we just to say so we have the after this we have a meet and greet. If you have any more questions, you're welcome to ask them. So I have a question about the recruitment. Um, in the, um, the study there are only uh Ishisha Kodi and uh Kiosia, yeah. for example. So uh, it would be interesting to uh, uh, to assess the uh, association between uh, OXA48 and uh, DSBR, yeah. because in the uh, first group and second group, the resistance, yeah. natural resistance, it would be interesting because um, for Klebsiella and Shirisha uh, Kodi, you don't really need the OXA48, they just have uh, a cover panels if there's not an insurance to associate with the resistance. So I wanted to know if there's any data on the specific associations between DSBR. So, so, so those data will come because the whole genome sequencing of the first uh, strain collection is done now, and that will come in a few weeks. So I can't, I can't tell you. But this, these are uh, where it's going to be looked at. It's been looked at more closely. We didn't. And I had a specific comment on the um, resistance for colistin in uh, northern Italy. I think yeah. uh, the resistance is a point. Uh, mutation, so it's not a uh, present. No. It's associated to, uh, I don't know anymore if it was NDM or TDC, mm. but it's the strain that survives and yeah. carries yeah. Uh, its resistance uh, throughout the uh, hospitals. Yeah. It is a clonal. Uh, um, uh, yeah. It is a clonal, um, it's a clonal uh, transmission in, in Italy. Yeah, you're right. Okay, one final, final question then. Yeah, so um, uh, I'm kind of glad you uh, mm -hmm. uh, abandoned your request for the milk advice. So, uh, <laughs> but uh, um, I think, you know, from a clinical point mm -hmm. of view, it's, uh, it's obvious. Um, it's, uh, it's, super, it's super relevant. Um, I guess um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't associate um, uh, sort of basic uh, microbiology mm -hmm. research on the topic uh, as such, because a lot of that. Um, um, uh, is blending into that, and will blend into that in, uh, in the future, obviously. 
um, in order to be able to address uh, the uh, topic in a, in a holistic way. Um, and uh, you know, I think we can link together um, a super strong motivation of those physicians who sort of uh, pursue that. I, I definitely agree. I mean, although it's, it was a lot of epidemiology, the, 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 the resistance mechanism without the microbiology, we will not be able to actually look at it. And the same, we're moving more and more towards uh, whole genome sequencing, and we will look at clonality, we will look at virulence factors, associated virulence factors, and so on. And six. So just to say, at ECDC, basically it's 99% epidemiologists, and then we have, the rest are microbiologists, I'm one of them. So there is hope <laughs> for microbiologists to drive more uh, epidemiology question in the future. And one good example is uh, Joel. <laughs> Sorry. Well, thank you, no, thank you for giving the talk. <laughs> I really, I think we have to say thank you again for the talk. So, um, just uh, as a uh, final say, so next week's, um, not next week, next month's meeting, uh, we were supposed to have a presentation and it's 